this gung-ho photo hung in our living room every day of my life. And I would ask my dad about this, and he'd say, Dad, Dad, yeah. just a group of men raised to play. It took me until I was a junior in high school to realize that this flag and the famous flag raising were one and the same. He would not, would not talk about it. I used to use the Vietnam War. That was my generation, and it was I, on the news every night. And I would say, what about this? And how's that compared to you? And da 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 and he'd go, da, da, and walk out of the room. He would mm -hmm. not talk about it. He wouldn't. The only thing I ever heard was what I would call the lighthearted mm -hmm. things about it. I knew Eleanor Roosevelt visited the troops. I knew what jungle foot rot was. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> he would not talk about it. And if yeah. I pushed, if I really, you know, he would just get up and walk out of the room. He just wasn't going to talk about it. So we really didn't know any of this. Anyway, it's so nice to be here. I'm used to teaching 19-year-olds uh, who are always scrolling on their phones, so this is very nice. <laughs> and I have been coming to the, the Gold Star Military Museum since my girls were little, and they used to always call it Mike's Museum. So I want to thank Mike Vogt as the curator. He's the one who pulled this together. And I have the only dissertation that begins and ends with pie. And it starts with the gathering of Iowans eating pie at a potluck, and it ends with the soldier coming home to the kitchen and eating half a mince pie and drinking a gallon of milk because he'd been in the Pacific Theater, and he told his mother, those are the two things I thought about the most. And as Ernie Pyle would say, blueberry pie was the most longed for food of veterans of that. Um, I have been talking about World War II at Iowa all over the state for uh, a number of years, and I've often said that Iowans are in two of the three most famous photos. Now I can say we're in three of the most famous photos, and that the first would be this wins the Pulitzer Prize in 1944, and it's Colonel Robert Moore coming home. He had served on the North African front. Uh, extreme number of casualties in southwest Iowa. Red Oak, Iowa ha loses more people, per, more men per capita than any other town in the, the country. And so when he steps off the train in Villisca, Iowa, and his five-year-old daughter comes running to meet him, his wife is like this, overcome with emotion, and that in the Pulitzer Prize winning photo, the nephew is cropped out. But I rather like the nephew, and you can see just a bit of his face, because that's us. That's us wondering what's going on. But it is a beautiful photo, because you can't see the faces. It could be any of us, okay? And that story of emotion and homecoming, and that. The other most famous photo, and these five, their faces are quite prominent, are the Sullivan brothers. And this was a posed photo around the hatch as they were to serve on the unsinkable USS Juno. And as we know, that ship went down. And the parents were asked to go on a bond raising tour. Those were always problematic. And they were never told what really happened to their sons until afterwards. Uh, so a lot of times, these, these photos and the consequences are very traumatic. I want to, as a historian, I know it's right before lunch, and you're probably hungry for pie, so I'm just going to give you uh, a few minutes. But as a historian, we want to think about the context, okay? What were people experiencing at the time? You know, when they were in the morning and they were getting their newspaper and they were wondering what was going on with perhaps their boy or their girl who was off and that. And uh, realizing, too, the war had been going on for three years, over three years. And the winter of 44 and 45 was the worst. As Stephen Ambrose said uh, in the Battle of the Bulge that winter okay, in Europe, that we were throwing our finest young men. We had more casualties then than ever. And so Americans were just so tired. And it's the, it's the end of February. How do we all feel right now? Okay? It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. So you bring all of those things together 
And the cartoons, Carlisle was the sub cartoonist for Ding Darling, and he would have a number of, of interesting ones. And here you can see him looking at the soldiers, okay, uh, and what was going on in the Pacific Theater, and reminding people as well that Germany was close to surrendering, surrendering but there were two theaters, and Americans had to keep on until Japan surrendered as well. When we first see this photo, it's on page two of the Des Moines Tribune. That was the evening newspaper. And when we first see it in the Los Angeles Times, it's on page three. It, it wasn't a significant photo. It was just one of many and that. But it captured people's imaginations. And it still does. People are still fascinated, as you can see the crowd today, by this photo. And so it was Americans on all of the home front that we're starting to s pay attention to this photo. It's the end of February. Some things are constant. Irritating tax processes, okay? And so you see this cartoon where he's doing his tax returns and he says, I shouldn't complain. You know, what's going on in Iwo Jima? And that, and of course, children are children, okay? And uh, playing war games constantly uh, and that. This is where you see there was a lot of headlines, major headlines for Iwo Jima, and a lot of photos of what was going on. Um, but it was also competing, if you will, with the Battle of the Bulge. And this was a, was a horrific point in time. And lots of maps, and you see this so people could follow along. This was a generation that really did know its maps. And that, again, you can see, okay, uh, the headlines and that, but other things going on, babies being born, okay, uh, and that, again, more headlines, and you can see that this is one of the toughest in marine history. What does that say, okay? So people were, at the time, paying attention to this battle. This was very, very serious, and that, Lots of crater uh, shots, overheads of the, the island, and you got an idea of what was going on. Uh, some of the cartoons, okay, uh, at the time we look back on, <laughs> um, we wince a little bit, but we were so tired of both theaters of war, okay, and wanting it to end. And this, you see another headline, okay, uh, you see again, uh, the, the roads and the, the island, Sulphur Island, okay? And again, the headlines, again, the map, okay? Now, we take for granted living in a visual culture. We've got phones everywhere, and we have far too many photos. I always tell my college students, it's a good thing there weren't photos, and there's maybe three of me during all of my college years, and that's okay. Uh, but we get these photos later, and, and they're very hesitant with these. We didn't see Pearl Harbor photos until February, okay? Um, so we have to think about that too. But again, Iwo Jima is getting the huge headlines, okay? Uh, this is rather atypical in the newspapers. And you see again the headlines, okay? So this is the end of uh, February, the point in time we are now. Again, you see some more photos, okay? We also have to remember too, this is when the photos were coming out about Bataan and what had happened there. And when you saw, this is before the Holocaust, we were having any photos at that. You've got to think of the chronology and that. Uh, but seeing uh, those men who had l almost starved to death and that. So again, the, the anger building, the wanting the war to end, the wanting to have some heroic image, something to cling to, okay? This is what the American people were wanting at the time, okay? And we see, finally toward the end of that, this is the Battle of the Bulge, this is the headline, but do you see what's right below it, okay? It doesn't make the fold, as they say in journalistic terms, okay? But there's the photo, okay, again for a second time. Uh, and that at the end of the month, on the bottom of the page. And then at the end of the month, the last day of February, 
is when you see the gung ho photo and then also this uh, as well. And so, yeah, that's part. yeah. So that was the photo that appeared in the newspaper, the Des Moines Register, on the last day of February. Any questions? <laughs> Another famous photo. So. Yeah. So was, were some things published, obviously, that... You know, I, I don't know. I'm not. Um, I looked at the home front and that. So um, part of the reason is that's why we like the war correspondence and the personal stories, because we felt we could, we could trust those as well. Um, but no, the Americans were not told everything going on at the time. For, for all sorts of reasons, for morale, for security, uh, and, and just the time lag, you know, in getting that. Okay. Um, first up, I want to say, I didn't know any of this. My dad would not talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Wheeler, when he went to write a book, sent tape recorders to my dad and wanted him to tape record anything. That, and the, the name of the book is Bloody Battle for Mount Sarabachi. And whenever Dad would have got out of that tape recorder, that was my chance to learn something. So I would sit down, he'd shut the tape recorder off. And then we'd look at each other like this battle of wills, who's gonna outsit the other one the longest. And invariably I was just, you know, I had it, I'm out of here. But and then the, so then I would try to sneak around one of the rooms thinking that he wouldn't know I was there. <laughs> go ahead and talk on the tape recorder and I'd learn something and pretty soon I'd hear this, Katie, I know you're there. And then I'd give up and go to my room. But anyway, so he did this tape recording and did not want me to, to know what he was gonna say. To my regret, I, I would have liked to have heard his stories from him, from him. Um, he, this Iwo Jima battle was was one, you know, this flag raising was one minute, but he also served on Bougainville, Guadalcanal, and Midway, along with Iwo Jima, which you think those four battles were major Pacific battles that he mm -hmm. survived, not only physically, but mentally. I, I think of this man who um, went through these horrors of war and came home and was just able to carry on with his life. Uh, he, Mom said when he came home, he had a few nightmares. Dad eventually quit, and all I knew was this man who was wonderful father, wonderful husband, very civic-minded. Um, he became a fireman and was fire chief for several years. He coached all the Little League baseball teams in, in Brooklyn. Um, was a fireman, fire chief for years, um, booster club president. I mean, he just he, he <clears throat> entrenched himself into the community, which, and he lived in Brooklyn his whole life. Loved Brooklyn, would not have left. He was, by the way, he was the first man from Brooklyn to enlist after Pearl Harbor. Was yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, to me, I, you know, he was dad. He, well, I said, you know, I, I, this flag, or this uh, gung-ho photo hung on our living room wall the entire time I was growing up. And when I would ask him about it, he'd say, oh, that group just raised a flag. Boom, that was it. I wasn't going to hear it anymore. So, it's just, um, it's amazing to me that he could serve on those four big campaigns, come home and literally put this behind him. I mean, he saw, saw and was involved in some horrible, horrible things. And he was, he was fine. I mean, he put it all behind him and, and he was fine. He was a great father, great husband. Um, I do want to say one thing that the whole, the whole neatest thing other than meeting this gentleman um, when he found out about all this, but I got a phone call one day, and it was a man by the name of Damien Leader, and he said, you know, 
I'm so glad to hear your name in the news. And I said, why is that? And he said, I grew up hearing that Harold Keller saved my dad's life. And he said, over and over again, my dad would tell us the story. And he said, now I get to contact you and say thanks. He said, if it wasn't for your dad, I wouldn't be here. And I'm sitting here thinking, whoa, how funny is this? Our dads served together, and here we are talking on the phone. But apparently this Robert Leader had um, been wounded. My dad saw him get hit. The medics came, they patched up the front side and then moved on to the next guy. And my dad knew that the worst wounds were in the back. So my dad went over and rolled him over and with his little medic kit, patched him up. And uh, Robert Leader always contributed dad to saving his life. So I get this phone call from his son and he's saying, you know, I, I grew up hearing every day that your dad saved my life. And he said, I just want to thank you. And I'm going, oh, great. I didn't know anything about it, but great. I'd say it was nice to meet you. I read in a book too that 95 to 98% of the men that he went through basic training with were killed. So he was, he was one of the few lucky ones. I missed a couple of points. One, I didn't give you the casualty numbers. So from the American side, killed in action 6,800 roughly, a little bit more than 6,800, roughly 20 to 21,000 casualties injured. So huge, huge losses on the, on the state side. Obviously the Japanese could not go anywhere. I mean, they were there to die, they knew that. Uh, again, hard to count, a lot of them were in case, uh, sealed up. So again, just a, just a horrific, horrific 36 days, which was supposed to take five days, is what they estimated. They bombarded the heck starting in November of 1944. They actually had a naval bombardment, that's how they started it. B-24 Liberators came and just dropped bombs for an extended period of time. And then prior, so the February 17th photo, they again hit it with Navy, um, just throwing shells at that island. And they thought they were gonna go and there weren't gonna be anyone survived. And they were dug in and dug in big time. Actually, the biggest network cave was actually in the north end, not on the Mount Suribachi. I mean, there was caves and in, um, in, uh, in actual facilities have been built, but the, the biggest ones are on the north side of the island. Clint Eastwood made a movie from the Japanese perspective. I think it was Iwo Jima. Letters from Iwo Jima. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, it does a very good job telling what those young people went through as well. Yeah. They didn't want to be there either. No, they did no. not. Okay. <clears throat> Here are some numbers that people don't really realize, I guess, and that's a lot of them because the people swept the society your dad wouldn't talk to you. Why we owe these people? First of all, you have to know that World War I, World War II, the only wars this country's been in where our government didn't bring them all home to bury KIA. <clears throat> Every other American that has died before since that war should be buried in our soil. World War II alone produced, and I've seen two things, 405,000 KIAs and 408. But if you do the math, that's 220 KIAs a day of Americans. That's a lot of people. 183,000 American kids lost their dad in that war. People don't know this. But half of that number of 408, so you know it, are either buried overseas, the 26 American cemeteries around the world, at sea, or on the wall of a missing somewhere. Those are figures we'll all have to know. Thank you. Can I read a, can I read a quick poem to you that touches my heart? It's entitled The Noble and the Brave, a Veterans Day Tribute. So this is to all, all of our veterans. When America had an urgent need, these brave ones raised a hand. No hesitation held them back. They were proud to take a stand. They left their friends and family and they gave up normal life. To serve their country and their God, they plowed into the strife. They fought for freedom and for peace on strange and foreign shores. 
Some lost new friends, some lost their lives in long and brutal wars. Other veterans answered a call to support the ones who fought. Their country had requirements for the essential skills they brought. We salute every one of them, the noble and the brave, the ones still with us here today, and those who rest in the grave. So here's to our country's heroes. They're a cut above the rest. Let's give the honor that is due to our country's very best. 